Hi, I'm Seth Juarez and I'm in Stavanger, Norway, the oil capital of Northern Europe. All right, I'm in Stavanger, Norway, about to meet with Iris Claussen. Iris, how you doing? Bra, bra, hey, welcome right. to Stavanger. Hey. That's how you say hi in Norway. You ready to talk? Yeah, let's yeah, do come it. on, let's have something. Iris, it's been a long time. How the heck are you? I'm good, I'm good. I haven't seen you in a long time. When was it last? Uh, I think it was MVP Summit, if I remember. Not the last one, but the one before. Yes, that's true. MVP Summit. Well, that's a long time ago. Yeah. And we were recording then as well for Channel we, 9. We did. You were doing band stuff, if I remember. Yeah. Right. So every time I see you, it's it's on, it's on camera. It's recorded, right? Yeah, just to prove that I've met you. So, or, or do you see a pattern there, like security-wise, <laughs> oh maybe? Oh, my gosh, maybe. Well, I'm not know. stalking you, I promise. So you were, doing, you were doing band stuff back then, right? Yeah, I was. Are you still doing that? Uh, yeah, I'm still doing that. That was um, that back then and also now it's more of a hobby. It's not mm -hmm. my, my full-time job. But I, I work for a startup in Sweden. Okay. I construct, what which is do? really fun. What do they do? Uh, it's, a, it's a system for large enterprise companies to, mm -hmm. do, uh, to do different types of planning that's driven by data. For okay. example, data-driven budgeting, uh, prognosis and so on. So it's data consolidation and Basically, most large enterprise companies, unfortunately, still to this day, have this massive sheet in Excel that they will pass around to different uh, departments to fill out uh, their budget. Yes. And maybe my data depends on somebody else's person's data, and it needs to go there first, and I'm not supposed to see their data, and so on. Right. And it becomes very difficult to manage, uh -huh. and people end up with different versions, uh, data that collides, uh -huh. and they it's a lot of problems involved there because Excel isn't really made for multi-user scenarios. Okay. It's a fantastic product and it's also, but it's also a little bit difficult to use for some. So we made sure that to really simplify the whole process and give also access level control and also good data consolidation and more in the cloud in a very easy and comprehensible way for large enterprise clients. So this is like Excel but backed with data and relationships and stuff for companies. Yes. Okay, and you... it's for multi multi user because we don't replace Excel. Okay. So when you say multi user, does that mean that like every user buys an account on your system and they can use this, or how does it work? Uh, no. Uh, so one a client, a customer, a client is usually one large company. Okay. Uh, they will buy a license depending on how many users they expect uh, to have, okay. and will adjust the price uh, from from that number. Mm -hmm. So. It's a, it's a company that provides uh, this tool so to how, their users. So my, my question for you, and this is, as I've heard about multi-tenant applications before, is this the kind of application that you're building? It can be. <laughs> so like, I've always had a hard time understanding how you set those up properly because like, let's just say you have company A and company B and company C that are using your system and A, B, and C have like 15 users each. How, how do you do that reliably? Um, well, it's a good question. That's actually how I started at Construct. Uh, I joined the team to take it from an on-premise, uh, basically a one-time one install per client solution, mm -hmm. to make it a multi-tenancy solution, uh, to reduce costs among, among, uh, among other things. Sure. Um, but the easiest way to explain this is if I, I can draw this up for you and show we you We have a handy-dandy piece of paper. Yeah, actually, I, it might seem like, oh, by coincidence, I have paper here. But uh -huh. I love drawing, and I always have something with me. Um, so I can just fill with All right. that's not a device of some sort. All right, let's do so, it. So you, right. the, the question that we're, we're, that's on the table right now is you move from a, like an on-premise application for each of your customers into an application that I presume is in the cloud? Yes, accessible in the cloud. Accessible, that's accessible from the cloud that has multiple companies. So why don't you just show me what that is and then we can get into how you actually do this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just I'll draw up the, the on-premise install first. So okay. say this is uh, some uh, custom, customer A server and you do an installment of uh, Construct and it's uh, all the users will then go ahead and access it there on, on that, that server. Okay. And it has its own uh, data storage, data mm -hmm. source and 
yeah, it can be whatever, it doesn't really matter. So that's on premise. Now, if we have several customers, and say that customer B also wants to have this, then we would have the requirement, hey, you need a server, and you need to have X, Y, Z in mm -hmm. terms of hardware and so on. Then you need to go ahead and you need to install this product and also <laughs> allow us to install um, a tentacle of we're using Octopus Deploy okay. to manage uh, our continuous deployment process. So you need to allow us in some way to continuously patch and uh, upgrade the product. And uh, then you need your data source, all that, and then the users can finally access it. There's a lot of moving parts sure. to this. There's a lot of cost in terms of license and a lot of requirements that we put on the customer, mm -hmm. which we could manage. So we thought, why don't we just take all this and move it to the cloud? And by the cloud, of course, we mean somebody else's computer. Right. We chose Azure uh, for a first round. Now we actually have a split, so we use two different cloud providers. But we went with Azure first. They have a lot of a lot of computers somewhere. Sure. That's the easiest way to think about the cloud. Okay. That's really simplifying it. Uh, but that's uh, that's the cloud. Actually, the data sometime in the future might actually be under the sea. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> so they have uh, been experimenting with uh, subsea uh, data centers, which is really fascinating, uh, and everybody should look into that. That's, because they're that's really automatically cool. cooled, right? Oh yes. <laughs> so here, th so what you're saying then is that typically for on-premise applications, you would effectively for each company have a yeah. copy of everything. Yeah. But when then, then we need to manage other people's uh, our stuff on other people's machines. I see. Which is everybody knows that. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Uh, so, so instead, we'll, okay. we're going to put Construct up here, okay. and then the users for this uh, customer can access it, and the users for this other customer can access it, and so on. And when, they, when they're there, when they're using our product, it feels like, oh, this is installed just for us. Nobody uh -huh. else is using it. It's but mine. How do you, it's untouched. How do you... How do you do that? Are you like doing the same thing? You're like making multiple VMs and putting the same thing in the cloud? Or is there a better way to do that? Because I, I'm assuming that doing this, but in the cloud is the same thing. There's still other people's machines and you're still replicating stuff. Uh, well, I guess technically you could do that and have one massive uh, server or a server farm mm -hmm. where you just, for every client, you just deploy a new version of the application and give them a, a, a different access point for it, but that, that wouldn't make any sense. And no. If you can reuse things, it's then reuse them. And also right. if you have a stateless uh, system, which we do, we, we have, mm -hmm. then it's easier to reuse. So we only have one instance. Now I say one instance, I also take into account that we do have several instances just to make sure that if one goes down, we still have the other ones. Right. But I say one instance as in terms of one access point. Got it. Uh, but you still uh, have it. It seems yeah. like one instance for right. the customers. So they're all using the same the same system. So how do you structure this kind of application? Because obviously it doesn't seem like a smart thing to just yeah. replicate this in the cloud. No. How do you But if I have just one, uh -huh. what would you what can you see any potential problems with that? Well yeah. what would be a challenge like, moving from that to here? Like my my problem is like Company A and Company B's data, how do you manage that? How do you manage it in a way that is it's not accessible? Like there's got to be some huge barrier that's completely secure. Yeah. And then how do you make it so that the data does not leak between Company A and Company B? And that's why I'm asking, yeah. like, how do you even begin to do that properly? Yeah. So uh, data storage is uh, is not, I don't want to call it a challenge because it's so normal with uh, multi-tenancy solutions today that it's not really a challenge. But one thing you need to think about is how to deal with data, as yeah. you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And you have different uh, options. Uh, you have, for example, you can have uh, you can have a server. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to use SQL Server as, as an example, okay. but basically you can do whatever, any, yeah. yeah, whatever. So you have uh, one server, and then you have one database, and all the tenants use the same database, mm -hmm. and you can choose to either use the same tables. Uh huh. Or you can have uh, separate tables. But but they're the which, same uh, yeah. data, same schema, right? Yeah, same okay. schema. Now you can see a problem here, right? <laughs> uh, or a problem, yeah. or something that might be. Hmm, not sure if I want to do that for every scenario. Yeah, right? because it feels like for one database. Like if you're going to have like a million 
customers, you're going to have a million tables of exactly the same thing over and over oh, again in the same database. Yeah, and then you're going to have a lot of <laughs> a lot of network traffic. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be uh, performance is also going to be affected, sure. and you do you have a. I mean, you have a higher risk of data leakage uh, of compared to that, at least. Yeah. Uh, so you definitely don't want to serve up the wrong data. That, that would not be fun. Makes sense. And uh, yeah, if you break something, you break the whole thing. Right. So. So that's that's one option. Okay. So what's so, the next option? Because I, I feel like this would not be a good idea. And then yeah. and then the other thing that we said would be a good idea would be like let's just have a virtual machine for everything. It feels like this would be all the way in the other end. Is there yeah. a better intermediate way? Okay, so we're talking about, so we're talking, still talking about data. So yeah. one option would be that we have, we have a server with, uh, with a SQL, or a SQL server instance per, yeah. per, um, uh, per client, yeah. per customer. I mean, all this can be on one server. Yeah. So, each they get their own dedicated which is that's that's like the very good level of isolation sure. uh, pretty much almost as good as it gets um, but you do have the problem of costs and resources yeah, here and also that you need to manage everything all this needs to have replication and backups and all that stuff and it needs to be managed somehow sure. and for us if we're, we're a startup that's a lot of cost involved <laughs> Uh, so that that's not the most popular option in terms of uh, in terms of multi-tenancy solutions, and there there's an option in between here, and that would be that say you have a server instance, and then you have one database per customer. They can still they, and the databases will still you know be very similar in terms of how this, this, there's the skeleton how they're structured. Sure. But the data is going. They're not going to mix the data across databases. Right. You could take it to, if you get to the level where you need to uh, expand the database because one customer has a lot of data, uh, you can scale up, which basically means uh, bloat out the database, mm -hmm. which you can get performance issues again, uh, or you can create several uh, databases and do sharding, so you split oh, the data across databases, right. and you can also do that across servers and so on. So you still have the option of scaling a little bit up, but a lot out. Uh, which, which, which you could do with all versions, but this one I just feel was more manageable for us. Yeah. And you still have the separation of the data, uh, and also it, it's easier to set uh, access levels. I see. So I, the reason why I like this is because you might have a huge company that's global as a tenant, and you can do the sharding for, for locations, yeah. and you can scale out for them. And so this allows the data to replicate really yes. well for your customers. Azure actually has some really cool stuff around that with their elastic pools. Oh, uh, okay. Which unfortunately we never got to try because it, it was still new when uh -huh. uh, when we went to Azure. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a good setup, so we're happy how we're dealing with it. But uh, that's all uh, elastic pools in Azure uh, manages a lot of that. So my question then, because... Okay, so my, I'm in assuming... Terms, in terms of scaling up. I see. So my, my question is, generally I would imagine the application is here and then it would call into the database. How does it know which database to use? Because, like for me, I usually just put something in the web web config, but you can't do that with this kind of application, right? Because you yeah. have multiple tenants. So how do you solve that issue? Like, are you swapping connection strings? And then on top of that, how do you even do authentication? Because you might have someone with the same email address that works for two companies as a contractor, right? Yeah, which so, uh, I do, for example. Right. So how do you? Like, I feel like there's a big gap that I need to. I don't understand. So maybe you can help me with that now. Yeah, I can. I, I can draw this up actually. Okay. So. Uh, I work for Construct, uh -huh. and uh, let's say I, I'm. I also work for Mindcamp uh -huh. actually, because Mindcamp uh, is a consultancy firm, uh -huh. and uh, it's our main investor. Okay. Both have the same uh, owners uh -huh. and same CEO and same product owner and so on. But logically, they're different places. Yeah, different okay. places. So I have, in terms of Construct, I have both the, uh, those addresses. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's construct twice, so blah blah blah, blah mm -hmm. and, and dot net and dot net. Okay. So the only thing that's different here in the in the URL is here the, the a the, name, the, the yeah, record, yeah, the first part of it, and this is what we use to know which tenant it is. So now I'm just going to refer to the customers as tenants. So mm -hmm. a tenant has a bunch of users. Okay. So a tenant and user is not the same thing. Okay. So 
this is one tenant and this is another tenant and Iris as a user exists in both of those two but Iris has different data in and even maybe two. different access yeah and different access levels so what so how do you take this like because I imagine like you're in your controller you just want to be able to access data how do you like I'm confused. How do I go from here to I'm in the right database? Yes, I'll explain that. And, and then there's the other issue yeah. of authentication, right? How do you even authenticate properly? Absolutely. Right. Uh, this is one way you can do it. Okay. I mean, another way uh, of indicating which tenant it is is to let the user fill in which tenant it is, which means getting them to do more work which they don't like. Well, and then um, they can fake it and that would be bad yeah, too. Yeah, they, they, they can. I mean, but they can fake this as well oh, if they true. happen to yeah, know or they can try guessing. And mm -hmm. I mean, you could automate it um, and not sit in front of your computer all night and try to do the guesswork. But what happens, um, should I explain the Let's do authentication, authentication. first. Yeah, because yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Because like my problem is if you're authenticating with them, that means you're coming from a different database. Then you yeah. have, so well, how I'll, do you do I'll, it? I'll show you. Okay. So say I'm authenticating with, with uh, one of those two. So I, as a user, I go to the browser and I type in construct something, something, mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And that request is then pushed further to wherever our, uh, our application or our system okay. is hosted. What happens then is we'll go ahead and we'll take out the first part and we'll look at it and we'll go check in our own, in our master server, we're going to check, does this tenant actually exist? And if it I doesn't, see. we go like, eh, no go. And if the tenant does exist, then we go ahead and we verify the credentials of this user, the data they entered. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at the password hash and we look at the username and so on and access level they have. I see. Uh, but we actually never, uh, we actually don't let the request go all the way through until, until we have verified all these things. Um, Pretty much every single call we have in our app in our system requires authorization okay. uh, and authentication. Yes, good to yeah, <laughs> mention both of yeah. those two. So uh, now uh, we use Owen Middleware. Uh, I'm the one. My responsibility has been going to a multi-tenancy uh, scenario from on-prem and also managing everything that has to do with um, uh, with authentication as well as scale and distribution okay. of the system. So we have our Owen middleware, and if we have the request going in, before the request uh, travels further, it goes through our Owen middleware, which manages the authentication and the authorization. Okay. Uh, mostly, uh, more important is the authentication itself, of course. So what happens, the request comes in, and when we have verified all of this, and we support different types of authentication, uh, but mainly OAuth 2 is uh, the preferred method okay. most of our, our, our uh, tenants like to use. So once uh, that is verified through the third party uh, provider that they or we use, then we set a token, a JWT token, mm -hmm. which we then we save it in local storage because mm -hmm. uh, we prefer that over cookies. And that one is going to be sent for every request sent from there on. Uh, the header is going to go ahead and have this uh, of token, which is going to be sent with a request. And because this token is signed, if it's tampered with, then we know that something uh, bad That's is wrong. going on and then we're just going to kick out the user and they need to log in again. So we're going to deny the, the request and they're not going to access the data. But this, this solves the problem of how, because once we get all that and we know which tenant it is, we know, okay, so this is this tenant, oh, and it has this database, so we're going to go in that database and we're going to look at uh, the users there and we're going to go and verify you know, the password exist. and all this kind of stuff. Right. This is at a very high level, at a very high abstraction level, this is how it looks like and I mean, it, it makes sense. Implementing this in code, uh, it's not necessarily difficult, but you need to think about a few things as well. Okay. Because then every single request you make, you want you want to look and serve up the different data. Because the worst scenario is that you serve up somebody else's data. Yeah, because then that's embarrassing, right? You get sued. Yeah. <laughs> you get sued, so <laughs> or you mess up somebody else's budget. And some companies, you know, yeah. we're in finance. We also have laws that we need to think about. I see. So a couple questions. So when you're saying that stuff is happening in middleware, yes, 
like the first time you're going in there, the middleware is checking to see if there's a token. If there's yeah. not, it's going to say log in. Yep. As soon as the token is set, then it goes through. Is that right? Yeah. And then it gets into, like I assume, some type of controller that has an authorized attribute. Yeah. We, we use a web API, and the whole system is based on many microservices that go through a proxy. Um, and for every request, you send off to a token, and usually access the access point you get to is a controller of some sort. Okay. Uh, but what specifically is the question? So the what? question that I have is, I understand this part, and, yeah. and I understand you get the user. What I don't understand is, how do you get the right? Let's pr let's pretend. Yeah, the you're token using is verified in there. So if if you don't have a token, then you need to enter your credentials, and we verify that, and then we set the token. If you have the token, we verify the token, mm -hmm. and then let the, the request pass through. So once once you you've done that, so I understand this part, and this is actually those really are two cool. different uh, middleware. One that actually lets you authenticate, and then we had another middleware that manages the the token setting itself. Oh, I see, I see. And so if the token set then it's not going to do that middleware. But if it is set, then it's just going to use the authentication, making yes. sure the tokens are. So my question is, now that that's all in there and you know who the person is, my question is, how do you know in the controller, like, like let's pretend you're using Entity Framework, how do you know the right DB context, right? You, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> because like you're literally swapping databases yes. out. How do, you, how do you do that? Uh, let's see, maybe I should take a, a new sheet here and to better explain that. Let's do it. Here, yeah. I'll, I'll keep this one over here to, so I can soak this puppy in. All right, so you have a request, uh, say you want to get uh, a particular budget. So right. you have this request and it goes to... to the middleware, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we'll skip that for now because okay. we've explained we've that. We've already done that, yeah. yeah. So it goes to a controller okay. and we verified uh, the, the header, which is sent with the, the token uh -huh. and we verified it everything is good and we proceed to the controller uh -huh. now we use dependency injection in our system okay. uh, in every single service and library that we have and we've chosen to use AutoFAC. okay so the way this works is um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with dependency injection so uh, my understanding is that you have these like interfaces that are just passed around in constructors everywhere and yeah. they're sort of hydrated or created at runtime am I yes. close Yes, that's 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 a yeah that's a good explanation. Mm -hmm. So we have this controller and say that this controller in its constructor. Now I'm going to, going to really simplify this because I would never put uh, direct data access in a controller, okay. but we'll do this just to skip the business logic. Okay. And it says that it has a dependency on I something uh, repository, and that will be our access layer. And so that's the constructor of the controller. Yeah, so okay. it goes like this. Uh, now. This is uh, this is just an abstraction, an interface. So, uh -huh. th which this means is that when this controller is uh, instantiated, it's going to be instantiated when the request comes in. Right. And when this one is created, it's going to expect an object that implements this contract, that implements this interface, our repository. Sure. Uh, so, this repository. The 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 the, con uh, the the concrete instance of this repository, the class that we've mm -hmm. written that implements this uh, interface, is itself going to depend on another interface. This is usually chain, really yeah. long chains and can get really messy and ugly uh, if you don't manage them well. But it's going to have a dependency. Let's say I context is going to be the database right. context. And what we have done is that when this uh, this context doesn't have any dependency itself because that's the, that's the starting point mm -hmm. is the lowest level in the chain sure um, the leaf we call it the leaf or okay. the root I'm not sure which yeah way. but yeah you, you get my drift what we've done instead that uh, we said that every time this uh, context is created we want to go ahead and we want to take uh, the request and we're going to look at the token and we're going to find the tenant uh -huh. and also also verify in the URL yeah, as sure. well that you know the origin is correct and all those kind of things and once we are 100% sure that this is valid it's uh, it's authenticated and we also have the right tenant and we have the uh, right level of access mm -hmm by using the, the database for this particular tenant. Then we're going to go ahead and return a context that with uses the right with the right database. Okay. 
Uh, no. One conf little confusing, uh, so this one is set to X, Y, Z. Yeah. So obviously when we're going to look up this tenant, that's going to be in our own master database. Oh. Unfortunately, that also sort of becomes our our uh, our fort, uh, the the one place of failure. Yeah. So that one is well well uh, guarded, and absolutely everything is encrypted, and yeah. we've made sure to keep it really safe because that is unfortunately that is if that one goes down, then we're gonna have issues. Yeah, and so uh, that that's now I'm understanding because and like, it's on a different server. <laughs> yeah, and I like the idea you're saying there's like this master database that has like stuff about the tenants. Yeah. Only stuff about the tenants, and what happens is. Once you get this token, this, by the way, this has already been hydrated through the middleware, yeah. then you can actually pull from the master database the right location of the other database, you generate a yeah. context, and this all gets hydrated all the way up to yeah. the controller. Yep, exactly. Okay. So you can think of our uh, master database like a, like a bucket, uh -huh. and you go in there and you go, uh, go scrambling for, uh, for the right tenants. Mm -hmm. And uh, for each tenant, you're going to go ahead and get a key, and that key is going to provide us uh, access to that tenant's database. Oh, so I the see. key you get is an encrypted string, okay. and uh, it's only going to be decrypted at the actual time of use, uh, access uh, to the data, because we also have a cache that we use. I see. Unfortunately, we decide on writing our own cache, oh, and I could, I could spend a week talking about the problems we've had with that, uh -huh. and the joy. As yeah, well. caches are good until they don't work, right? Until you need to debug them. That's right. It's the amount of time somebody's like, oh, wait, did you forget to clear the cache? Oh. I was like, oh, yeah, man, I could have saved time. some time debugging. So we, we use a cache. So we always, you know, if we can use the cache and get the data from there, we will do that before we do all this. Because obviously, see. these are a few more requests and sure. will require more. And like the tenant stuff won't change very often. So it's smart Rare. to just cache that stuff, yeah. right? makes a lot of sense. OK, so now that you've hydrated this all the way back up, when you're yeah. inside the controller, you literally, because you're taking a dependency, you just start using the DB context the yeah. way it's so supposed to be using. All this, all the objects created here, and we usually wire up, a, we always wire up a per request. Mm -hmm. Everything here is going to belong to tenant A. And, and the thing I love about this is that, I mean, before when we were in this diagram, I was like, there's an application here. Like if you do this with the middleware and with the yeah. dependency injection, literally in the controller and the controller methods, you're just using a context. And there's yeah. no, like, and I love the way that you separated this out because like a, a new dev can come in and just write controller stuff, yeah. take the right dependencies and not even have to worry about that. Yep. And, it, and it's all it's all managed from one point. We have the module uh, which where we have all the wiring up, where we map the interfaces to uh -huh. the concrete classes. Uh, so obviously we're doing like a class level interfacing sure. and not uh, feature interfacing. Um, so you can combine them, but yeah. it, it gets a little bit difficult. So we have every we, you manage it from you have one point of configuration, uh -huh. which makes it much easier. And the thinking I had in my head when when I you know, decided did the architecture, how we're going to deal with this, we don't want at any point the client shouldn't know which tenant it is. Right. The services shouldn't care or know that there even are tenants. Yeah. And it's important because we still allow for the on-premise installation. So we need to be able to run those side oh, by side. Oh, I see. And because of the way this architecture is built, it doesn't care. Yeah, it doesn't care. So I get my data. Yeah. So the last, the other question I had, and by the way, I think this is this is absolutely amazing the way this this works, and it's it's cool that I finally I'm starting to understand it. The last question I have is when you're moving from on premises to the cloud, and you're using this kind of architecture yeah. that you're talking about, it sort of changes the way you do stuff, right? I mean, I've heard of containers and microservices. Is that the kind of stuff you're doing? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Can you help me out uh, containers and microservices are definitely not, not the same thing. Okay. Um, it's quite common to use containers when you have microservices, mm -hmm. but you don't have to, and they, there's not a direct link between the two. Got it, okay. Containers is, you can think of it as a very lightweight virtual machine okay. that doesn't have its own operating system, but it thinks it does. Okay, okay. So it's borrowing the host's operating system and the resources available there. Mm -hmm. And what you declare in your template for your containers, what you declare is what resources to access. Okay, okay. So that makes sense. So when you're moving over though, like, 
like how do you break this up in a right way? Maybe we should talk about what applications were like before <laughs> and then how yeah. you start to break them up. Yeah, because uh, unfortunately but with this drawing here, if I, if I move it over here and I, I made this drawing here, mm -hmm. that this is construct and then it has its uh, data source that it accesses. I've, I've drawn it as one big instance and maybe it would have uh, you know different layers like this and would make it right. uh, a so-called uh, monolith mm -hmm. which we do not have uh -huh. uh, we actually have uh, separate services uh, so we've divided up our, our system is uh, has a lot of different services mm -hmm. and they all work behind a firewall and a proxy to sort of limit uh, access and and communication outwards and all these services talk to each other over HTTP. Mm -hmm. We will introduce messaging at a later point, but right now we don't need that. Uh, it adds, it adds, uh, it adds more complication to the system, and mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to benefit as much from it right now as we will later. Okay. So they communicate over HTTP between each other, but if one service goes down, it's not going to affect the other services massively. They're not going to start falling like dominoes, right. which is a, a very good thing. And we can deploy them separately, which cuts down deployment time and cost, and also makes it easier to manage the bug profile and so much more. Everybody should do this. So my question for you is, like, how do I go from this to this? And like, Because I'm imagining that like I have a hard time. This is the part I've had a hard time with when this with this microservice stuff that's come out, and it's been it's not been super recent, but it's fairly new. How do you go from a monolith to a microservice architecture? Is there like a way to do it? Because I, I imagine that you went from your on-prem to a more microservice architecture. What yeah. was that process like? Uh, luckily for us, um, uh, the developer who started writing the system from the beginning of uh, separated things into separate libraries, which is uh, a very good starting point. And right. there were already different uh, several services. Now we have even more. But he, he was thinking about it when he implemented it. But when you already have something uh, mm -hmm. in place, what you want to do is use the same thinking he used from the beginning of is basically you need to uh, identify, say, domain boundaries. You need to de define categories which are somewhat isolated mm -hmm. from other parts of the code, say that you can base it around uh, a larger feature. Uh -huh. Or we have, for example, a service that manages oral calculations. So we have a calculation engine. We have an aggregation engine. Okay. Uh, we have a separate uh, service for just manag managing account information, user login information, and so mm -hmm. on, but not authentication. That okay. is also separate. I see. And so you have to sort of, and this is why I guess people never give me like a yours answer your answer is one of the better ones because everyone's like well it's hard to say because it really depends on what your application does yeah, it depends a lot and so those are examples you gave me of separation yeah really good. but and this ideally they're all isolated completely but that is also ideally mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to have a hundred percent isolation sure. at some point you're going to have some interdependency and and sometimes you have to be okay with that because yeah. you got to balance uh, resources. Versus, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's better to put something out and give value to the customer and then refactor. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But the last question I have, and I'm hoping you can help me out with this, is I feel like deploying something like this is much easier than deploying something like this, right? Because <laughs> there, you might have 10 or 12 microservices. And you need to deploy them all at the same time? Uh, I, don't, I mean, do you? <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, so why don't you, you explain this to me? So we, um, you can deploy them all at the same time, but then you know if something fails, there's going to be yeah. there's going to be a, a fun uh, fun time for yeah. you. Uh, but let's take one service as an example okay. how you can do a deployment. So uh, we manage all our deployment uh, from one point from uh, from one server. We have different environments, QA sure, sure. and all that, and we use Octopus Deploy to automate. Uh, push out our, our deployments. Okay. Right now, we just have a replacement uh, deployment where basically we just push out a new one which overrides the old service, uh -huh. uh, which means that we do have a little bit of downtime. Okay. And also, we have even more downtime if it turns out that we did test, you know, the, the true testing is always done in production. <laughs> Sure. I mean, yeah. how, yeah, how, how else? else? Yeah, so then if we need to do a rollback, that's going to take more time. What we are implementing now, which we'll do very soon, is the so-called blue-green deployment, um, where there's uh, less or hopefully no downtime whatsoever. And having microservices is going to make it much easier. 
So I've never heard of, you said blue-green deployment? Yeah. What is that, what does that actually mean? Can you show me that? Yeah, uh, so blue-green deployment, say that I have uh, this service A, which uh, is deployed and is working fine, and incoming I have, you know, um, the, the uh, let's say service A2, yeah. which needs to be deployed. So I'll go ahead and I'll deploy this service, and make sure that it runs, everything works fine, and do the amount of testing can be done. If it has an API, we can test it through the API and so on. And once we are sure that it works, we'll just go swap the two, and we'll make this one blue, and then this one becomes green, because this one is the one that's active. The way you manage that is uh, whenever you have a mod like this, you're going to have some sort of, hopefully some sort of traffic manager that also doubles as the load balancer. Got yes. it. And what happens is you will just move the pointer. So if it was, uh, if it had a, hey, when requests come in here, you're going to go towards this one, then it's just go ahead, oh, no, by the way, you're going to go here instead. Uh, it's very important that uh, you need to think about the state and data here. Mm -hmm. We have our, our services and our, all our services are stateless, which makes it much easier to suddenly just do a swap. Uh -huh. uh, but this is something you've got to keep in mind. So by doing it this way, if it turns out that we didn't test properly, something is happening, we need to roll back. This one is still there, it's still blue, and we just point swap back. Swap the pointer. Yeah. So it's like, a really, it's, like a, it's like a saying, let's put it out, let's make sure it works, swap the pointer, Let's make sure it really works. If it doesn't, put it back. <laughs> Otherwise, you just start killing this old one. Yeah, right? it does mean. I mean, you're gonna have uh, have them sort of have them up simultaneously. You're mm -hmm. gonna need a bit more resources and so on. But it's definitely worth it because most customers today they're, they're not okay with any downtime whatsoever. Right. But you can never have zero downtime. Well, in the cloud, you can't. You yeah. know why? Because the cloud is somebody else's computer. Mm -hmm. It's not your house. You're renting an apartment in somebody else's building. Sure. And you can't, there's gonna happen things in the building. You have busy, noisy neighbors mm -hmm. and so on. So things are gonna happen. So you need to have a very good deployment and rollback model, in particularly when you are in an environment where you don't have full control. So would you say that this is part of DevOps? Is this DevOps or is it more than that? It's definitely part of DevOps. DevOps is developer operations. Mm -hmm. So anything that's related to the operations that are very close to the development process. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Well, Iris, you have blown my mind. You have talked <laughs> about multi-tenant applications, how to actually authenticate them, how to identify them. We've talked about the middleware that does that. We've also talked about token authentication and authorization. Then you went in and showed me how to actually switch database contacts based upon multi-tenant applications. And then you, the other concept that was really cool is this master database that's like <laughs> your operations. And then we got into microservices and green blue deployments did i get that right yeah and uh, in in azure azure they actually call it just swap i don't know if they changed the name uh -huh. for it but uh, i like that they had it very early on in the azure portal with the cloud services that you mm -hmm. can do a swap because mm -hmm. it introduced this to more people uh, because basically all your cloud service means you have a lot of services uh, behind uh, within one virtual ip so it's accessible from one ip but they all have their own ip that's cool and when you do a swap it just switches a the virtual pointer swap, yeah and it makes people actually think about things and make them more likely to use this sort of, you know, management way. So, yeah. Well, this is cool. amazing. And by the way, I'm so glad to be in your hometown of Stavanger. <laughs> what is there to do here? We should go do something. Yeah, well, do you like hiking? Ah, uh, yeah, I could do some hiking. Should we go? Yeah, definitely. I, I'll, I'll take you to the cloud. I'll take you to the cloud of Stavanger. <laughs> okay, now that sounds like I'm going to get tired, <laughs> but let's do it. Ah, you'll be fine. Let's, let's go. go to the cloud. Before we go on this hike, though, what is this street? It's beautiful. <laughs> this is the color street in Stavanger. It's a street where all the houses here, mostly cafes and special shops, uh -huh. have different colors, very happy colors, very bright colors. Love this place. Yeah, it My is. My hair used to look like this. Oh, jeez. It still <laughs> looks good. What is this hike? 
Uh, this hike is called the uh, Prekestolen. Okay. It's a very popular hike, two kilometers. Wait, until... two kilometers? We've already gone two kilometers, no, or we have to no, go two kilometers? We've gone like 20 meters. <laughs> yeah, we got loads and loads to go. Okay. But it's going to be worth it, I promise you. It's going to be worth it. Is there, what's at the end? Is there like candy at the end or something? Well, no, at Donuts. the end it's going to look like this. So the mountain is just going to go straight down into the fjord, about 700 meters, I believe. That sounds like I'm going to get hurt. really beautiful. Okay. Well, it hurts if you fall down, I guess. <laughs> Holy cow, this place is beautiful. Yeah, I know. And as we're climbing higher and higher, I guess you could say that we're uh, deploying to the cloud. Oh my goodness, we're deploying <laughs> us to the cloud. Are, we, are yeah. we really going that high though? Yeah, we're going up to Jure. Oh my gosh. And I'm pretty sure. Hold on, there's a hill here. <laughs> we got to take it slow. Are you good? Are you good? Yeah. Okay, I'm, come on. I'm let's okay. go. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Holy cow, this is beautiful. Yeah, I'm sure I can't is. believe we made it to the top. Um, this is not the top. I mean, <laughs> we're at at some point, some top, but not the top. So we go all the way there. We're halfway, dude, halfway. Oh, uh, all right. But it's a top. I can do this. You can, can do, do it, this. come on. All right. A little scared, right? I might wet my shorts here. This is really <laughs> how high I'm sure is you this? Should get closer to the edge. Though. How high is this? Get a little bit closer. Hold on, let's see. Yeah. Holy cow! How high is it? I think it's about 600 something meters. Like we'll, a, we'll say 700. That's right? a half mile down, guys. Yeah. I think I just wet myself. Okay, we'll just stay here for a while until it dries. Oh okay? my gosh, this is crazy. It's okay. Oh, I need to back it up. <laughs> here we are. We made it. Yep. So we made it to the top. Yes. It was only hard for the most of it for me. <laughs> yeah, and now we just have to go back down. Oh, <laughs> You want to jump? Uh, no, no, that's the fast way. I might do that. So, were you a programmer your your whole career? I, I heard you did something else before. Uh, yeah, it's true. Um, well, it's true. I did something else before. I um, I was a clinical dietitian before and mm -hmm. personal trainer. So that must have taken a long time to study. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. Well, I didn't. I, I don't feel like I wasted time though. But uh -huh. uh, I do wish I spent less time studying that. So when you when you because you were probably doing that professionally. At what point did you think? I want to do something else. Mm, it took a couple of years. I wasn't. I wasn't happy uh, as soon as I started working professionally as a dietitian. I started my own clinic. I, I don't know. I didn't find it uh, as intellectually challenging as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. So, what made you think like I should be a programmer? Or, or did you? Was it something that happened? Was it something you did? Something you saw that made you go down the track to be a programmer? I just. I just knew I wanted to do something else, something different, and I wanted to make sure that I consider all the options out there. And I mean, that, that's that's a lot of options. So I got friends uh, to help me out and write a long list of things I could do professionally. Mm -hmm. And on the list was programmer. And then based on what I'm good at, or feedback from friends and family, uh -huh. we started crossing things off the list that didn't fit. And in the end, I had a couple of things that I think was like graphic designer. But then again, I don't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> I wanted less opinions. That's right. <laughs> and less interaction uh -huh. with the client. Mm -hmm. And so programmer. Okay, so what was your first, do you remember, because I remember at, at early on when you started your career, you did a lot of like 
like stupid question <laughs> blog post. Tell me about that. Yeah, I still do stupid questions all the time. But they're not stupid <laughs> questions, right? They're like real programming questions. It actually started when I did my first um, internship. It was a place that wasn't so good. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a guy there who was annoyed at all my questions. He uh -huh. kept saying it was stupid. So that's why I started the blog series. Because, uh -huh. okay, so here are the stupid questions. But I'm actually learning something. So uh -huh. I'm fine if people think I'm stupid. Because at least I'm learning something, people, I guess. The difference between you and me is that people know I'm stupid. It. And so it's okay. So can you tell me like your first programming success where you're like, wow, I really like this? <laughs> uh, my first hello world actually. And uh, I actually, that's a blog post. I, because I blogged about it when I started. So I actually have my first hello world as a blog post. Okay. And I'm so proud. Now it's just like, oh God. And so your first hello world, you're like, I'm hooked and I'm going to do this forever, right? Yep. And then things probably got more and more and more complicated. And you started make, building bigger and bigger things. Yeah, what but was that like? But that's the starting bits, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, well, the, with the hello world, it's, it's very simple. But at the same time, I at that point, I understood that from here on, I just have to do things like this, putting together tiny pieces mm -hmm. until it becomes something big. Mm -hmm and I can do anything. Oh, so what was like one project that you are like really proud of that you're like, holy cow, I got this to work? Uh, well, after studying for three months, uh, we were told, and everybody in my class were new at programming. They've never done anything before. So you took before. like a three month class then? No, it was a two year, but okay. after three months, uh, we got an assignment to make a photo editing tool. And oh. I was in charge of having the feature where you remove red eyes. Uh huh. And that was hard yeah, because, because I, I didn't even know eyes. like what are pixels. I, mm. I didn't even know what mm. pixels are. Mm -hmm. So going down to the level where you have the, the array itself and you're working with it. And I also learned a little bit about performance there because nice. <laughs> it wasn't a fast editing tool. But it turned out really good. And okay. yeah, I learned a lot. Well, we've got a long walk back. Yeah. Should we get started? Yep. You got your parachute? <laughs> Are you good to go? Hold on, wait, before we do that, so you were also a PT, right? How, yes. How, what do you do to see how fit someone is? Because I want to well. see how fit I am. Is there like some tests you make, you're going to make me do? Well, there are a few tests. Um, usually I just put them through a lot of pain and see how soon they start crying. I think we should do that. What do you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Let's do it. Yeah, All right, let's, let's go. It. Okay, so how fit am I? I mean, out of a scale one to ten, <laughs> what do you think? It depends what you want to be fit for. Oh, well I want to like be able to like, I feel like I want to go through in the entire nine hours of Lord of the Rings in my couch. I mean, am I fit for that, do you think? I don't think anybody will ever be, uh, not for that. No, but seriously, I, I did like a push-up, right? That's good. Yeah, no, no, no. It is, it is a good start, but okay. it's... Well, I'm in pain and we have like four kilometers to walk. Should we get started? Yeah. Turns out it wasn't two kilometers, it was four. Whoops. My bad. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Okay, so we are at your parents' house. Yes. And you invited us to dinner. What are we having? Um, this is a very typical Romanian uh, dish. It's called uh, mitite. Mm -hmm. Looks delicious, doesn't it? And it, it your dad made it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's been yeah. working all night, all morning. Uh, so yeah. are, you said Rom you said Romanian. Are, are you? So you're from Romania? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm actually from Romania. I'm born in Romania. Uh -huh. We moved to Norway when I was about five years old. Five? Yes, five. Turning six, almost six, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
So I've spent most of my life in Norway and other countries where I've moved around. But originally I'm from Romania. Mom, dad is from Romania and uh, we got a big family from, over there, from Transylvania. This? Transylvania? <laughs> yes, I was like, oh, I almost yeah, like, I yeah, got yeah, all the dish yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So are you a vampire? <laughs> no, oh. no. Not before no. 12 o'clock. Not before 12 <laughs> o'clock, she says. Okay. No. And this is the rest of our family. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Uh, so this looks legit delish. I think we should have some. Yes. This is a uh, minced meat. I believe this, this one is pork, right? Uh, no. Uh, no. 30%. <laughs> what's the, what's pork, the rest? So. Is, is it meat? The a rest? Beef. Yeah, beef. Okay. All I all I heard was meat, and I was <laughs> yeah. sold. sold. Yeah, and you gotta have mustard. So this one is Romanian mustard, uh -huh. which is a bit yeah, on the spicy side. <laughs> it's, somebody told me once I was a bit on the spicy side. So me and this yeah. mustard <laughs> yeah. will be delish. And these are potatoes. Yes. <laughs> and that's bread. I know. I know. I know these. And things. that's salad. Yeah. Salad, and then yeah. your folks. He's been around the world and knows these things. I know these things. So. Yeah, All right. but so the way you eat it is you slap on a lot of mustard on your plate somewhere, build mm -hmm. a little tower there, mm -hmm. and then you grab some of the mitite and you dip it in the mustard and you eat and you have some bread next Wait, to it. Wait, what do you call it? Mitite? Mitite. Yeah. Little ones. Yes. Midi yeah. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. little ones. Wow, it's like my, I have such a yeah. good accent. Is that Romanian? Did I just <laughs> say that? Yeah. If you're gonna travel to to Romania, you're gonna get this all over. Okay, yep. so if I go this is typical. Uh, uh, you eat and drink beer. This is yeah. yeah. We so have we have beer too, uh, not Romanian beer. No, it's, it's a Norwegian one. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, let's dig in. Let's do it. Yeah, go for it. Well, Iris, it's been wonderful being with you. Yeah, thank you for coming. No, I'm, thanks uh, for having I'm me. I'm glad you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a hard one to explain to your boss otherwise. You almost killed me, so... Uh, <laughs> almost doesn't count. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll see you later, my friend. Take care. <sighs> oh.